Hello, my friends. Welcome back to another episode of Market Watch Mondays. As always, I am your host at Mike Me Up with two P's. That's right, Mike Me Up with two P's. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, or uh, actually, I'm not really Instagram much, so don't so don't DM me there. But you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my DMs are open there. I'm always hopping on, talking football, NFTs, whatever, with the folks on there. Uh, and then, obviously, I'm always on this channel every single week, every single Monday. I've yet to miss a Monday. Actually, no, I've I've missed a Monday, but I've yet to miss a week since I've started this show, and I'm trying to keep that streak going. Uh, so I'm recording this episode pretty early on this week. I'm recording on Wednesday night because I will be out all weekend, heading out to um, Salt Lake City, Utah, to go uh, go do some shred some powder uh, at Park City. My first time over there uh, with me and my girlfriend, so super excited, super pumped about that. We rented a pretty cool like ski in like Airbnb thing, so it's gonna be dope. But uh, I had to get the content out before then. It's actually going to be a pretty short episode this week. I just want to cover a couple quick things uh, before we move on. Um, but uh, before we get into anything, by now, man, y'all know what time it is. Hit that intro, baby. All right. Two things I want to cover uh, this week are, one, I want to give a quick update on where I'm at with like the rookie ranks. I know people are interested in that. I'll be dropping the rankings in the Patreon, uh, in the Wolfpack Patreon tonight after I get off this episode here, uh, my full ranks, but I want to get a little bit into the rookie ranks a bit. And then two, I want to talk about some of the big moves that obviously happened this week. This is a pretty, uh, pretty, you know, I'd say very, very uncommon, um, but it, it is, it is definitely worth covering. And I want to get into that first. Obviously, first big thing is Aaron Rodgers is going to be staying in Green Bay. Uh, supposedly is going to sign like a $200 million with $150 million guaranteed contract, which is a big time, big time payday for him and a big time drain on the Packers ability to pay anyone else. But you know, he is the key is the cog in the machine. Um, so, but he actually came out and said that like he hadn't signed anything yet. So who the hell knows, man, Aaron Rodgers, full of drama, but hall of fame, one of the best to ever do it. But fantasy wise, the only reason why I care about it is because this probably means that him and Devontae Adams are going to stay linked up. The best, in my opinion, the best duo, uh, the best quarterback wide receiver duo in the NFL that it, that's been in the NFL for a couple of years running now. <clears throat> and uh, so I just want to say one, just congratulations to anyone that drafted Devontae Adams. I saw his ADP was creeping into that late third, sometimes early fourth round of startups in this offseason, which is insane to me. Like I've, I've always still had Devontae Adams as a top 10 wide receiver. Uh, I, I get to a little bit older, but like I said, this year, my ranks are going to be pivoting a little bit heavier towards going to win now, uh, win now players because they're just, they're too cheap. They're too cheap. And so if you picked up Devontae Adams at that price, congratulations, because that's a potential league winning wide receiver one and like a true wide receiver one overall. I put out a poll actually and asked people like, Hey, do you guys prefer Cooper cup at pick 20 or Devontae Adams at pick 30 to my surprise? A lot of people made the right choice. They picked Devontae Adams at pick 30. So basically in that middle of the third round, uh, mid to late third round, I expect like if you're in super diehard leagues, you could probably get them towards the back part of the third round still because people just hate old receivers, right? As soon as you hit that age, people don't want anything to do with you. So Devontae Adams going to be an incredible value. Aaron Rodgers still going to be a great value. I mean, he's 30 years old, but if it's a four-year contract, let's say he even plays two to three years of that. In my opinion, that's still worth like a top four, fourth round pick. Uh, top top a top pick in the top four rounds of a startup draft because he is a difference maker at the position, especially if you're like me and you play in a lot of highly punitive uh, punitive leagues for quarterbacks. Where if you're a shitty quarterback like you know uh, Jameis or Haneke or whatever, someone that throws a lot of interceptions, you actually get punished for that. Uh, I usually play like plus six touchdown, minus four interception, minus six for a uh, 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 pick six back. So. Aaron Rodgers is someone that actually really crushes in those types of leagues because he is so accurate. He throws so few interceptions. His touchdown and completion percentage is also very, very high. So I think that's <clears throat> the key things that are, there are it's both good for Devontae Adams, it's good for Aaron Rodgers, but also it's tangentially very good for Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon if you are a big A.J. Dillon driller because that offense with Jordan Love stunk in the one brief moment that we saw him, right? And, and it's unfortunate that Jordan Love is not really going to get a great chance to play uh, but what's more unfortunate is like, I've always said like it's that pick was always a little bit mind boggling to I uh, personally, to me, I'm sure maybe other people saw, saw merit in it, but you know, T Higgins was there. T Higgins was there. I thought they were going to trade up and grab a wide receiver to help out Devonta Adams because they literally have bums after him. Uh, and Aaron Rodgers has clearly wanted someone on that front, but no, they decided to move up and draft a Jordan love and become, and then have a disgruntled, 
uh, veteran, future Hall of Famer. And then now they're kind of like, oh, shit, he's like still pretty good at playing. So, you know, now we've got to pay him a massive paycheck. So it's pretty damaging to Green Bay's long term prospects. But in the short term for us, fantasy, all we care about is scoring points. And Aaron Rodgers is the key to that offense. He's the cog of that offense. Without Aaron Rodgers, that offense is basically uh, doo doo. So. It's really, really good. That's a big W for anyone holding Devonta Adams, anyone holding Aaron Rodgers. Um, big W to you guys. But the bigger move, Russell Wilson to the Denver Broncos. And what did the Broncos get back? They got like two first-round picks. Noah Fant, like, uh, was it like a second uh, or like and like a fourth or something? Whatever they got, not enough for an all-pro caliber player like Russell Wilson. Um Personally, from a fantasy perspective, I've always been higher on Russell Wilson than consensus. I, I mean, if you look at my prior videos, I think one of the best values I said that you could get a quarterback was Russell Wilson. He's fallen in the fourth round. Made absolutely zero sense to me. And I, hope, I mean, maybe this will help his ADP bounce back a little bit. I still have him as my QB9, so I'm sure maybe the people will kind of push him back, push him up. I have him ahead of guys like Trevor Lawrence, ahead of Justin Fields, ahead of Aaron Rodgers, actually. So Russell Wilson will continue to be a really, really good um, a really, really good quarterback. I think what this means, you know, fantasy wise though, is big boost for guys like Cortland Sutton, um, big boost for Jerry Judy too. But I think this is a bigger boost for someone like a Cortland Sutton, maybe even someone like a Tim Patrick, because as you guys know, Russell Wilson is one of the best and most accurate deep ball passers in the league. It's what made him and Tyler Lockett so lethal. That was one of the most efficient quarterback wide receiver duels in the league for the past few years running their deep connection was insane going back and thinking back to the type of player that Cortland Sutton is uh, I am now all aboard and back on board the Cortland Sutton train because Cortland Sutton even as a rookie was a specialist at getting down the field and drawing PIs uh, which was good because he was getting ducks thrown at him by the likes of Case Keenum Joe Flacco uh, Drew Locke <clears throat> but Link up with Russell Wilson, I think that's going to be a very, very lethal duo. And Cortland Sutton is still young. He's still a, in my, by, by my, by my eyes, probably still like a top 20, top 20, probably like a top 20 dynasty wide receiver. So um, if you guys held on strong to Cortland Sutton uh, on your teams, I think you were going to be very, very rewarded. It's also very good for the rest of the offense. It's good for guys like Javante Williams uh, and Melvin Gordon if he stays there because the offense is going to be able to sustain more drives. And, you know, Russell Wilson's getting a little bit older. He's still, got, he's still got some Jets, but he's not going to be running the same way that he was back in prime rust days. So, you know, there's probably some nice dump-off opportunities there. And just having a mobile quarterback, period, kind of opens up a lot of space. For someone like a Javante Williams, who's already a monster at breaking tackles, giving him a little extra space to work with can be pretty damn lethal. And that's something that he has not had at all in the NFL because – Drew Locke is definitely not uh, not the most mobile guy, and Teddy Bridgewater is not either uh, ever since he suffered the pretty catastrophic injury. He wasn't even that mobile even before that, but after that, he definitely kind of took a step down in that field. So I think this is really good for Javante Williams, a lot more scoring opportunities, a lot better offense. Hopefully they kind of spread that offense out, unleash a little bit of air raid instead of what they did in Seattle, which is basically bottle up Russell Wilson. It's actually insane that Russell Wilson and, the, and is Russell Wilson had like a lot less, like they, they were near like well below average in terms of the pass attempt. So when you have a Lamborghini, a Ferrari, like a Russell Wilson, it does not make sense to hold him uh, to like, just basically hold him up. And uh, if we're looking at Denver Broncos, I mean, they fired the prehistoric coaching uh, that was there before. Hopefully the new coaching regime, I believe they kind of came from the, the Packers side on the offensive uh, on the offensive mind. Hopefully, I'm totally blank on his name, but hopefully he's going to unleash those weapons and really let this offense fly. Obviously, Noah Fant got moved to Seattle. Not great. You would have loved to see Noah Fant stay with Russell Wilson. But having said that, like, I mean, real fans still a pretty damn good player. I, I did move him a little bit down my ranks just because I don't, I'm not sure like what volume they're gonna have. How 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 are they how are they gonna be able to sustain any drives on the offense like that? Seattle is going to get exposed. I posted this on Twitter, but Pete Carroll is gonna get exposed worse than Ben Simmons jump shot. He's been in my by my eyes like one of the worst coaches in the NFL for multiple years running. That's been propped up by Russell Wilson, and that that's really all there to is to it. Now he doesn't have a quarterback anymore. It's gonna be a bloodbath. So. Rest in peace. I send my condolences to you, all Seattle fans. Hopefully, there is still something exciting to watch, but it's just it's just insane. Um, I, look, I get it, but eh, I don't. I get it, but I don't. Like Russell Wilson was like the only thing holding that franchise together, and I guess it makes sense because he wasn't enough to get it done. But 
now I guess that team goes into a multi-year rebuild and try, tries to land someone else. It's just very rare like to see these types of trades, to see you know all pro caliber quarterbacks. And in my eyes, probably would have been a Hall of Famer had he not been bottled up by Pete Carroll for uh, you know the prime. I mean, not he's still in his prime, but a lot of the prime years of his career. It, it was just a travesty. It was a travesty watching Russell Wilson play in Seattle. It was a travesty watching them establish the run. I, for one, am just excited that Russell Wilson is moving. I think he gets a big downgrade in the weapons because he went from Tyler Lockett plus DK Metcalf to Colin Sutton and Jerry Judy. I think Colin Sutton is a lot worse version of DK Metcalf, and Jerry Judy is worse than Tyler Lockett. So it's it's a big downgrade on the weapon side, but uh, Russell Wilson is going to do what Russell Wilson does. I mean, if you guys think back to what Russell Wilson did before DK Metcalf got there, he was make he was the offense. I mean, there's one year where he scored like 95%, literally. I'm not exaggerating, like 90% plus of the team's offensive touchdowns because he rushed for them and he threw them. So uh, he is an absolute monster. So I'm very, very excited to see this new offense with him. For me, Russell Wilson, stock is basically staying the same or up, depending on where you were at on him, with, on him before. I have my QB9. Uh, for me, DK Metcalf is down slightly, but he's not really moving down much. Like I see people talk about plummeting him down like outside of the top 12 dynasty wide receivers. I think that's crazy to me because I get it. Russell Wilson is definitely a big impact on him. But at the end of the day, ballers are going to ball. Good players are going to play, and elite players are going to show out, and that's just the that's the bottom line for for wide receivers. Like DeAndre Hopkins played with the shittiest quarterbacks for a long time, and he just balled out. DK Metcalf, through the first part of his career, has had stellar uh, age adjusted production in the NFL, and I'm not going to bail on that just because Russell Wilson's gone. Do I expect him to have the same type of upside efficiency that Russell Wilson has? No, but I do expect him to predominantly be that guy in Seattle, and even in bad offenses with bad quarterbacks. You can produce high-end wide receivers. We've seen it before, time and time again. Allen Robinson, uh, DeAndre Hopkins. We've seen it. And, you know, Andre Johnson back in the day. Like we've seen this story before. So if anyone is trying to dump DK Metcalf on the low, I would try and scoop him up. The only reason why I moved him to wide receiver six is because he was already in a tier with a lot of guys, and this just basically pushed some of those guys ahead of him. So guys like Debo Samuel, guys like AJ Brown, it kind of just uplifted them a little bit. But at the end of the day, I'm still a big, big, big DK Metcalf believer, and I think you guys should definitely hold on to him, not jump ship on him yet. All right, that's what I got on the update side. I want to just quickly go over my rookie ranks here a little bit. I'll throw it up on the screen. So this is where I'm at with my ranks right now. And I've been thinking about this a lot for the past couple of days. So we have the combine. The next step is NFL draft capital. So you'll, you'll remember what I said before is like I had all the wide receivers at the top and none of the running backs because I was not sure about draft capital, right? But Brees Hall went into the combine, showed out, balled out. I've always really liked Brees Hall. I just didn't know where to get drafted. Now it looks like he's pretty locked in for at least an early day two. So second round draft capital. So for me, he kind of, jumps in that tier not because he ran fast but because i think it's a good indication of his nfl draft cap he was already my wide receiver he was already my running back one so he didn't really leap anyone else it's just that he moved up a little bit because i think the floor of where he's getting drafted moved up a little bit so that's the end draft capital is like everything for for running back so i moved him into that grouping uh drake london is my wide receiver one you might have heard me talk about this on some other people's shows over the past couple of weeks but looking at his age just metrics he was incredible i kind of like I've always had him in that same grouping. So Drake London, Traylon Burks, Garrett Wilson, you can pick you can pick or choose whichever guy you want. I think these are all going to be studs. Like I said, the NFL Combine didn't have any impact on my Traylon Burks ranking. Uh, if anything, I thought it was a pretty damn good showing. He went on his pro day and jumped to 35.35 and a half inch vertical. Uh, people are knocking him for the 32 inch at the on the on the combine. So and it's not like not like they can really juice up the. Uh, the uh, vertical jump so i'm not too really i'm not really concerned about that but overall like i think that's like the top tier of the of the talent in this class right it's the three wide receivers i'd say the three uh three triple a wide receivers plus like a double a running back and the fact that they're running back is why i'm able to push them up because the position is way more valuable malik willis coming in at 1.05 for me this is the one that can probably change the most. This and all the other quarterbacks, honestly, are the ones that can probably change the most because if they if he goes to the top five, top six, I can easily see him jumping to Traylon Burks, jumping to Garrett Wilson, maybe even jumping to Brees Hall. Probably not uh, in order to get to that top tier. So let's say let's say he goes to like the Carolina Panthers, for example, at, at, at I think sixth overall. I think that would be a really interesting conversation. Um, if he goes top ten, 
he'll probably stay where he's at. I do, I do believe that Drake London and Garrett Wilson are for sure going to be first round draft capital. I think Traylon Burks might be either a late first or early second. If he falls any farther than that, I'll have to adjust. But this top part of the draft. Um, I'm basically trying to secure draft capital and good players and, and avoid busts, right? That That's what you'll see. You have strong analytical profile wide receivers, a strong analytical profile plus athleticism metrics, Brees Hall. Uh, and then and then after that is a cutoff, and then you get to like the more, more dodgy stuff. You have Malik Willis, you have Isaiah Spiller, Kenneth Walker. Uh, so everyone tested out. Kenneth Walker tested out really well at the combine as well, ran like a sub 4-5 or five at his size. was very good. The obvious question mark with Kenneth Walker is like, Will he be involved in the receiving game? And that's that's a big question mark, right? Because you know, uh, unless like there, there, like it kind of reminds me of, like there's there's guys back in the day where you know he he is a monster on the ground, he can run a lot, but it, can he catch? And maybe he is capable of catching, but the more important question is, will he be used that way? And then the back part of the first is really really tricky. This is where I have a bunch of quarterbacks. And I don't know where their draft capital is. So it looks like Kenny Pickett is going to be the second quarterback off the board. And then uh, maybe like Matt Coral. I still really like Sam Howell, although like there aren't too many strong indications of the draft capital. And then Carson Strong, there's some buzz about him going in the first round. If these guys do go in the first round, like top 15, top 20, I don't think you can let them slide in the second round because the next group of prospects just aren't really strong enough for you to pass in that position. So you, a lot of them have holes, right? Like Jameson Williams, really exciting, really interesting player. But, like, what the hell did he do for the first two years? That's a major, major red flag on his analytical profile, and it's hard to construct a story. I mean, maybe your story is like, hey, he played behind Garrett Wilson, he played behind Chris Olave, he played behind Jackson Smith, and and that, we're going to go with that crowded wide receiver room theory. I don't like going with that that much, so I'd rather just play a little bit safe. Honestly, I, I think I have him ranked, like, even higher than I expected. You know, I really wanted to have Wondell Robinson up there, but he kind of just came in super tiny, didn't test that well. But he has a very, very prolific producer. If you look at his age adjusted metrics, look, look at his um, uh, market share of receiving yards, like Wondell Robinson is very well above the line. He's just really, really small. So I'm not sure where he's going to go draft capital wise. So I'm a little bit concerned there. Chris Olave went out there and blew like a 4 2 something. So he's speedy. He's going to get drafted uh, probably in the first round, if not uh, the early second. So. I think that the real debate there for me is like Jameson Williams versus Chris Olave. My eyes tell me that Jameson Williams is a better player, but my eyes, I don't trust that much because again, I'm not really a film guy. So it's going to come down to a coin flip on those guys. I'll probably just end up splitting shares. If I have like nine drafts, I'll probably go like, you know, four or five Chris Olave and then like four or five uh, Jameson Robinson in that spot. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the more interesting parts are some of these like dart throw, uh, running backs that I want to take a look at, like Zach Charbonnet. Uh, we know he's pretty athletic, so I'm not too concerned about him not having the 40 time Tyler, uh, Tyler, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try and butcher his name, but Tyler from BYU, he ran a four, six people didn't like that. I don't mind that at his size. It's not a killer, uh, for me. And he is someone that kind of kind of has like that tackle breaking ability. He doesn't have game breaking speed that doesn't show up anywhere when you watch him, but he's got the size. He's got the prototypical size. He has some receiving ability and it, he, it's not like he went out there and pulled on Elijah Holyfield and ran a four seven. So I'm not going to kill him, but I think in that late second round is when I'm going to be taking shots on guys like him, guys like Rashad White. I think Rashad White was an interesting one. Uh, JJ Zach Reeson brought him up as well. He said J his closest comp to him is uh, David Johnson. And it probably comes down to his size, comes down to the fact that he tested out very, very well at the combine, and he's a much, much older prospect. Uh, so, but he is an interesting one. So he's someone that I think I'm going to try and snag. Uh, he might move up a bit more for me. The more I look at his profile, uh, the more it's a little bit more attractive, especially, um, you know, the fact that he's able to... Uh, be able to uh, become a pretty uh, relevant receiver is interesting to me. And then the fact that he puts on the size and he has a speed, uh, the four, four something speed at his size is pretty, pretty good. Uh, if you're looking at those types of rounds. So really in those, in that mid to late second, like do I want to take a shot on some wide receivers? Or I want to take a shot on some running backs. Now, like I said, all comes down to draft capital. If Jameson Williams, Chris Olave, these guys are getting first round draft capital. I'm not going to pass up on them for like a shady, well, shade, not shady, but like a running back with holes in, in their profile because the draft capital matters a lot more at that point. Uh, but if some of them fall in the second round, if some of them fall later on day two and Rashad White, let's say he sneaks in the, he sneaks in the second round uh, draft capital wise or Tyler he sneaks, sneaks in the second round, that will be 
very very interesting so this is my preliminary thoughts right now this is not going to be in stone because we obviously need the draft capital but for the most part i think that top that top you know top five top six uh that top half of the first round is pretty much set i don't think there's gonna be too much movement there because like i'm pretty confident all the indicators say my guess for where the draft capital will end up is going to be where where you know where i think so i don't think there'll be too much movement there but we'll see what happens right over the next uh over the next few weeks once the draft comes around uh well i'll, I'll be updating my ranks like basically the week immediately after the draft so i'm gonna basically track the draft over the thursday friday and the weekend and then i'm gonna adjust my ranks and then hopefully get it out like within two to three days uh have a quick turnaround because i know people are relying on it for rookie drafts so that's what i'm aiming towards that's the stuff i'll be putting out over the next couple of months and it's gonna be it's gonna be fun man it's gonna be exciting i'm excited about this draft you know there's a lot of hate a lot of people dumping on this draft and saying it's shit and not enough talented players i think the combine was helpful because a lot of people tested athletically pretty well nobody like really botched it other than my guy kyron williams rest in peace to him i had him as like a borderline first round like early second round guy now he's like falling to like a third fourth round so that that one's painful that one's painful because i did have some kyron williams invested in debbie too which is just those those shares are gone so that's the but that's the risk you take when playing debbie man like you just don't know uh what's gonna happen you take a couple shots and you hope for the best but that's why it's always risky to kind of invest in these running backs is if they do go to the combine and they test out as poorly as kyron williams did then their draft stock goes like this and i have to move and, and their rankings on my ranking board drops like this as well so that's just one of the one of the downsides of everything but um that's all i have for you guys for you guys this week actually i uh, don't have anything else to go over hopefully you guys enjoyed if you did make sure you hit the thumbs up button hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications so that you are tuned in to all things Big Dog coming out to you throughout the week. You got my show, you got both the Noah's, Noah Squared, you got the Godfather himself, you got Max and the Animal. Everything is on the BDG main channel now, so it's all one place for people to see and explore and love. And, uh, you know, appreciate all you guys for tuning in every week. appreciate you guys for supporting me on this show. Uh, I've had this running for, I don't know how many episodes. I should probably go back at some point and count how many episodes of Mark Watch Mondays I've done. But the trick is like some of them are on BDG. Then I brought them over to Bunk Bit Breakdowns. Now we're back on BDG. So I'm just like kind of too lazy to go back and check. But at some point I will go back and check and celebrate some milestones, whether it's 200, 250, whatever. My guess is probably something in that range. But it's been really, really fun just doing these episodes uh, with y'all. And, and, you know, specifically the strategy stuff, the stuff that I really like as well is just doing interviews. I'm going to have more of those coming at you all because i'm gonna try and line up some nice guests uh hopefully a lot of the ogs that have been on the show before as well as some new guys uh that are coming up in the space i think there's a lot of talent up and coming so uh, i'm gonna try and get some more of those guys on the show and just just chat chat football talk off season and uh you know just just chop it up man that, that's what we're all about here all right that's all i got for you guys this week until next week peace.